morning, church family. Thank you, Christian. It is beautiful. If you would allow me a, a couple of moments of personal reflection before I begin the message. You know, as I've been re reflecting, you know, this is the last Sunday of 2019. You didn't need to be a rocket scientist to know that. But you, did you also realize this is the last Sunday of this decade? Mm -hmm. A lot of things have happened in 10 years. A lot of things have happened in my life in 10 years. But as I was reflecting on this particular year, 2019, this is what occurred to me. It was a year probably like most of us that had tragedy and triumphs. It had good times and bad times. It had happy times and sad times. That's just part of life. This past year, I had two tragic losses in my life. One was my mother who went home to the Lord in February. And the other one was a beloved pet that I lost in August, who I had a beloved cat that I had for 15 years. And you're an animal lover. You know that animals are family. And to have two devastating losses within six months was really heartbreaking. But at the same time, there were joyous times. There were wonderful times. I was able to lose, I'm not boasting, 35 pounds this past year by simply adjusting how I eat. By simply trusting in the Lord that my body would be able to adapt to the new food I was eating. I'm praising God for that. It's not to pat myself on the back. It's what God did for me. So always in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of sadness, there's always that glimpse of hope. There's always that glimpse of light. When I came here in 2018 and Crystal and I started attending, I had no idea that within six months you would call me as one of your pastors. And it has been a very humbling experience to serve you as a pastor. I, I pray that I've lived up to any expectations that you had, and if I've let you down in any way, please accept my apologies and, and forgive me for that. So thank you for indulging me on that. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we can turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for this day that you've made, that we can rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, thank you for bringing us through this year, through times of trials and tribulations, but also times of joy. Each time we were sad, Lord, you were able to heal our hearts. Each time we couldn't see a way out, you provided a way out. And Lord, as we look into your word today on this final Sunday of this year, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I know last week uh, Crystal and I were away, but I also know that Pastor Gabby preached through uh, at least a good portion of Luke chapter 2, so I'm certainly not going to repeat everything that Gabby said, but the Lord gave me this message three weeks ago, and I've been pondering it ever since. Now let me give you a personal story first. Many years ago, when I was living on the East Coast, long before I was married to Crystal, when I was living on the East Coast, me and a group of friends got into a car, and we wanted to take a ride up and down the East Coast. We thought we could make a lot of miles in that day. But you know, as the day went on, we got tired. We were switching drivers, and we got tired. And all we wanted to do was find a place to lay down, get a good night's sleep, a breakfast in the morning, and continue our trip. And we were looking, as we were driving into this town, we were looking for those wonderful words that you want to see, vacancy. You want to be able to see vacancy when you're tired and you're bleary-eyed and you can't go another mile. And yet every place we went, it was flashing no vacancy, no vacancy, no vacancy. We got to the point where we thought, are we going to have to sleep in the car tonight? Not that that would have been the worst thing. But you know, there was another couple in the Bible we're going to look at today. And when they got to the place they wanted to stop, there was a no vacancy sign flashing. Open your Bibles with me if you haven't already to Luke chapter 2. I'm just going to read the first seven verses. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Perinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David. 
in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. She gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. First thing that struck me about this passage, Joseph had no family there, no home to go to. He had to find some place to take his young family. There was no family there, no relatives, no place they could go. But what I want you to really see, and what really struck me, was verse 7. And that's what I want to focus on today. I want to give you a picture of what it was like back then. You see, with modern hotels and motels, we can roll right in, and there's a nice person, hopefully, at the front desk that's going to check us in. There's always, hopefully, a continental breakfast or something the next morning. We have a big-sized bed and wonderful accommodations. That's what we think about when we think about inns or motels or hotels. It wasn't like that back then. Just because we see the word in, let me describe for you exactly the situation that Joseph found himself in when he came into the city and he saw this no vacancy sign on the inn. Here's the way it looked. The inns were set up along the roadways for those who were traveling. There was no bellhops. There was no front desk. There was no hot breakfast the next morning. These inns were crudely built buildings, four walls and a roof. Now, the five-star inns had a well in the center. And what you did was you went into this building and you had to share common space under a roof and you may have well water. You had to supply your own food. There was no concierge to help you out with any amenities or anything, nothing like that. Now, in the finer inns back in that time, once you got into this box, they had rooms that were separated, they had walls, and you could put up some kind of a, a partition where you could actually have privacy to lay down. That's what the inn was, nothing fancy, just a place to rest. And so we find Mary and Joseph coming into town as they were ordered to, as everyone was going to their own city, and it says here that she was there to the time she had to give her firstborn son. Now, you have an idea of the inn. Now, around the back, you see, they had what was called a manger. And all the people that were traveling would take their donkeys or their horses or whatever animals they had with them and take them around the back of the inn and put them all in this little stable area. This was an area that was filled with straw, and it was a place where the animals could rest. There was a trough of water, but no people stayed there. The people stayed in the inn. They all stayed inside. The animals were left outside in the manger. And that's where we find Joseph and Mary. Because when they got to the inn, what did it say? In verse 7, it says, She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and laid him in the manger, in the pigsty, out back of the inn. Why? Because there was no room for them in the inn. Think about that. Here is a woman who is carrying the Messiah, the Son of God, and there's no room for Jesus. No room. And so Joseph and Mary have to go out back. And they have to stay in a manger. No midwives there. No nurses. No doctors. There's Joseph and there's Mary. And she gives birth to Jesus in a manger, in the straw, among the animals. Are you seeing the picture here? This is the humbling circumstance that our Savior was born into. He was a king, but he was born in the humbling circumstances out back. How would you like to pull up to a motel or a hotel and see that no vacancy sign? And they said, well, you can't come in because we're sold out. You can go around the back. That's essentially what happened with Mary and Joseph. There's no room for you, so stay out back. And it got me thinking about this. It got me thinking of the areas in my life, and this is what I'm going to challenge you at today, the same way I challenge myself. There are many areas in my life, and I'm willing to bet that there's no room for Jesus. No room for Jesus. For instance, let's take the first one, our prayer life. Oh, we pray in Jesus' name, don't we? But how many times do we really involve Jesus in our prayers? How many times do we really invoke him to be with us? 
Is Jesus in our prayer life? Or is there no room for him? Is it just lip service? How about our home life? Those of us who own a home. We think about the bills that we have. Do we pay our bills in an honorable way? Do we conduct our home when we have visitors that come to us? Can they see and tell that we, as a household, serve the Lord? Do they know that it's not just a saying on the wall, as for me and my house, we serve the Lord. But do they know when they come into your home that Jesus, there's room for Jesus in your home, not just at holiday time, but when they come into your home, they're not hearing bad language, they're not seeing the suggestive things on the television, they're not involved in anything that would compromise your walk or my walk with Christ. Amen. People know when they come to our house, you are not going to use foul language, you're not going to be dressed certain ways. You're not going to see certain things on the television. And if, if it's not up to you, then we have to say goodbye to you. Because our house is a house of God. Our house, before we moved in, we dedicated it to God. We dedicated it to Jesus. And so in our house, and this is not a boast, this is just how we work. Because there's areas in my life that I've found by looking at the scripture that Jesus has been kind of pushed out a little bit. There's no room for him. And shame on all of us when we deny Jesus in any part of our life. Those of us who are married, when Crystal and I were married, like many of you, there's a pastor or a preacher that performs the ceremony. You're taking your vows to each other. You're taking your vows to all of the witnesses and all the people that you've invited to your wedding. But you know what? Most of all, you take your vows to God. But how many times after we get married do we suddenly realize that we forget God heard every single word we said? Mm. Every word. Mm. And no matter how lovely it was or how emotional it was, God heard every word. And if we're making a vow to one another, to the person that we choose to marry for the rest of our lives, we make those vows to God. He heard every word. And how many times in our marriage, how many times do we just push Jesus out and we justify our behavior, or we hang on to anger, or we refuse to forgive. All of those things that we promised we would never do, we're going to honor and cherish and obey and all of these things until things get tough. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, there's no room for Jesus in our marriage because Jesus is going to convict us. The Bible is going to convict us. Jesus told us to live a certain way, but we don't want to. And so our marriages wind up in trouble or affairs start, or all kinds of other things. Think about your finances. How do you handle your money? Do you handle your money in a God-honoring way? Now, I know not everyone believes this, but I will share this. Crystal and I believe in first fruits. We believe in tithing. We believe in giving the first fruits of everything we get to God. Now, not everyone believes that. Not everyone lives by that. But we do. And one thing that I have noticed over the past six years since we've been married is when we give to God first, He always provides back. Because there was a time in my life that I didn't give first fruits. And I would either hoard money or I would buy something for myself late first. And then whatever was left, I gave to God. Well, God convicted me on that. Now we flip that around. God gets first. We live on what's left. That's just the way we do it in our home. But you have to wonder... And I want to challenge you on all that. How are you handling your money? Are you handling in a God-honoring way? Because you know God can take away that money tomorrow. And you might have nothing. Let's make sure that there's room for Jesus in our financial life. Let's make sure to the best of our ability that we are paying our bills on time in a God-honoring way and that we're not racking up unnecessary debt. The world will tell you, buy now, pay later. Amen. That is a recipe for disaster. Take it from me. I've been there. And I'm sure many of you have. You get into credit card debt, it's hard to get back out of. Let's think about our jobs. What has God told you to do? What do you work at? Are you honoring God on your job? Can somebody tell that you're a Christian on your job? I worked with a guy many, many years ago. Back then, we called him a religious fanatic because we didn't know any better. But I was working in a manufacturing plant. And this young man had graduated a Bible college, and one of the things that was drilled into his head at that time was all secular music was bad. 
all secular music was evil and shouldn't pass through our ears. Now, because we were working in a big plant, and there was a lot of machinery going on, one of the rules of the plant was that you could have a little radio by your station to keep you awake, especially if you're running machines. It's just something to keep you awake. Well, he went around the plant every day and shut off everybody's radio. All around. You can imagine he didn't make friends very fast, okay? He was shutting off, and it caused a firestorm. Why? In his mind, we were all listening to evil music. That was what he was convicted of. Now, we could look back on him, and I realized exactly what he was doing now. He was staying true to what he believed his faith told him to do. Where he crossed the line, I believe, was invading everyone else's personal space and saying, I'm dictating what's going on. There could have been a better way to do it. My point is this. When you're working on your job, can people see that you're a Christian? Are there certain things, you know, I used to get invited to the office parties until people found out I don't drink. All of a sudden, no invitations anymore. I was perfectly okay with that. I don't want to go to a party where people are falling over drunk. It's not my idea of fun. But I stood up for those Christian principles, and hopefully you do the same thing on your job. Whatever the challenge is, think about, is Jesus present in your job, or is there no room for him? Those of us who are parents or grandparents raising children. Have we brought up our children in the fear and the nurture of the Lord? Have we taught them biblical principles? Have we showed them clearly what is right and wrong? Not because of our own mind, but because of what the Bible says is right and wrong. Are we helping them through those difficult times in life, teenage years, those early years when all of the peer pressure is crushing down on them? Parents, those of you who are not parents yet, keep this in mind. Your children are going to go through a lot more than us older generation did because there's a lot more out there. There's a lot more twisted thought out there. There's a lot more perversion out there. And we have to guard our children. Is there room in our parenting for Jesus? Or did we push him out and we'll just do things our way? Think about the friendships you have in your life. I've had to cut people out of my life, didn't want to do it, but I had to cut people out of my life who simply were no good for me, simply tempting me all the time or dragging me down with them. We have to consider that God gives us friendships. We're not meant to be alone. Those of us who are blessed enough to be married, we have a lifetime partner, but some of us are single and friendships are important. What kind of friends do you have? What kind of friends do you have in your life? And what kind of influence are they having on you? A positive one? A negative one? Is Jesus in your friendships? Or is there no room for Jesus? Push them out. And you'll hang out with whoever you want to. Be careful about that. That's one easy way the devil can get us. One easy way is to bring the wrong people into our life and seduce us into all kinds of sin. Think about the relationships that you have. Those here who may be dating or will be dating soon. Is Jesus in your relationship? Are you using godly standards to select and have God show you the person that he wants you to be with? Or are you just out there dating anybody that will ask you out, regardless of their belief? Or are you waiting for the one that God has for you? I waited a long time. Glad I did. No regrets. But sometimes, you know, human yearning, we want to do what we want to do. Isn't that true? We want to do it our way because we know better than God. God's not right here with us. He doesn't see my struggles. He doesn't see my restless nights. He's not drying my tears. He's not helping my bank account. He's not giving me the job I want. God's not here. And we have a tendency to push Jesus away out of our life. And what I want to leave with you as I left with myself is God has been dealing with me over these past three weeks. Is there room for Jesus in our life, in every aspect of our life, or is there no room? Are we simply picking and choosing when we want Jesus to be in our life, and when we say, no, Jesus, thank you, I'll handle it, I'll do it my way. I see this message here, and I see this verse, and here is the Messiah himself. Mary gives birth in a pigsty because there was no room for them to be in. Shame on them. 
Make sure, as I close this out, make sure, examine yourself, especially as we're going into the new year. Whatever you need to repent of, whatever you need to come before God with, whatever you need to say, Jesus, I'm sorry I pushed you out of my finances, or I didn't include you in my marriage, or I'm sorry for getting involved with that person, or whatever the case may be, make this, make this commitment as we're going into 2020 together as a church and as individuals. Let's make sure, be absolutely sure, that Jesus is in every part of our life. You'll have no greater blessing, you'll have no greater peace, You'll have no greater love than to know that Jesus is walking exactly with us with everything we're going through. The minute we close Jesus out is the minute the devil comes in. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Jesus walks out, the devil walks in. Don't let that happen to you, not just today, but in the new year. Would you bow your heads with me? Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this message. Although a brief one, Lord, a powerful one. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us as a church for those times that we pushed you out. That, that those times that we made decisions that were not God honoring or were not your will. Forgive us individually, Lord, each time that we thought we knew better than you. Lord, let us take this message today, not only for today, but as we move into a new year and recommit ourselves to you in every aspect of our life, our marriages, our friendships, our finances, our jobs, raising our children and grandchildren, our very home life, Lord. Let our light shine as you told us our light is to shine. And forgive us for those times that we let you down. We're going to thank you, Lord, for the message. Thank you for Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful that uh, the Lord saw the uh, things together, that the thing that we will...